and we celebrate God for his life and for his faithfulness. As Dr. Quay said earlier, I've been involved uh, with him uh, in his life and also been involved in Word of Life. I think the last time I was here was about five or so years ago. Uh, the building was not fully completed at that time, but thank God for his goodness. We see uh, God's faithfulness in what he has done. Well, when a church celebrates 30 years, there is so much to look back to at the back. Last year, last 30 years. There are those who were there when the church was in Social Advance Institute, and there are those who only came when the church came here. Um, looking to the past is important because it helps us to have gratitude for what God has done. But after we've looked to the past, we have to look to the future because it is the future that inspires us, is the future that gives us hope. And, and I pray that as we celebrate 30 years, we will not just look to the past, but we'll also look to the future because what is going to happen in the future will be bigger, it will be better, and it will be greater than everything that has happened. Amen. The best is yet to come. This is an introduction to your future. This is an introduction what, to what God is going to do. And we are very confident that what he will do will be greater in every sense than what we have experienced in the past. Amen? Well, uh, Dr. Quid went ahead to introduce my wife, uh, Joy, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that he's here. And our very dear friend, uh, Reverend Eric Kwapong, uh, who is also a good friend of uh, Dr. Isaac Quay. I'm going to preach a message that I believe uh, speaks to what we are talking about, enlargement in our 30th year. And my message is simply titled, Change What You Are Wearing. Change What You Are Wearing. Look at somebody uh, sitting near to you. Look at them from head to toe and tell them, I don't like what you are wearing. Change it. Uh, if they didn't like it, look at another person and say, I think I should tell you too to change what you are wearing. Amen. And after you've told other people to change what they are wearing, uh, you have to say to yourself, I'm changing what I'm wearing. All right, because by the end of service today, everybody will change what they are wearing. Amen. Life is very interesting. We live life on levels and we experience it in stages. What you experienced last year is not the same as what you experienced this year. And God does not always give us everything at once. He gives it to us in levels and in stages. So at every stage in your life, you will experience something. But it will not be the last experience of your life. And so at a certain point, it changes. When I was a young boy, I didn't used to dress like this. When I was young in my days, every young boy would wear shorts or knickers. We didn't start with trousers. Uh, you start with shorts. And uh, over some time, uh, because young boys grow very early, uh, very quickly, every year you have to change what you are wearing. Otherwise, your shorts will become extra tight on you and uh, begin to give you problems so that when you bend or lift up your leg, there will be a manifestation 
uh, that is not good for everybody. So uh, you have to change what you are wearing. Then over time, uh, I remember when I was in class six, I, I hadn't worn trousers before uh, in class six. And we were going to have a party for one of our teachers who was leaving us. So my classmates decided where we're going to have the send-off party was closer to my house. So they will all come to my house and then we leave my house and we go to the party. I had two very good friends, two very good friends. Uh, both of them are very important people now. I wouldn't mention their name, but two very good friends. And because in primary school, everybody wears uh, knickers, shorts, um, this was Saturday, we were going to do the party. So I didn't know that they had trousers. I thought they also were knicker at home. So they were coming for the party. And when they came to my house to come and call me, they were wearing trousers. One of them was wearing what we call white drill a white trouser, white khaki trouser, and the other one was wearing normal khaki trouser, but they were wearing khaki trousers. And uh, I didn't have trousers, I had dressed in my shorts. And I felt so bad, I went to uh, the room and cried and cried and cried and cried. My mother had to come and encourage me uh, and comfort me that one day I will also wear a trouser. But uh, wearing trousers was an improvement for us because uh, at every level you have to change what you are wearing. And, and so every year as you grow, as you enlarge, as you expand, you have to change what you are wearing. Tell somebody next to you, change what you are wearing. All right. Now, so at every stage of our life, God is going to clothe us different. We're going to look at three scriptural readings. I'm going to read three portions of scriptures. And each one tells us the story of a person who experienced change in their lives. We'll read from Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. And then after that, Ruth chapter 3, verses 2 and 3. And after that, Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to 47. Genesis 1, 14, Ruth 3, 3 to 2 and 3, Mark 10, 46 to 50. So I will start in sequence from Genesis. Genesis chapter 41, verse 14. This is about Joseph. And it reads, Then Pharaoh sent and called Joseph. And they brought him quickly out of the dungeon, and he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Note the phrase, he shaved, changed his clothing, and came to Pharaoh. Then Ruth chapter 3, verse 2 to 3. It says, now Boaz, this is... Uh, Naomi speaking to Ruth. Now Boaz, whose young woman you were with, is he not your relative? In fact, he is winnowing barley tonight at the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself and anoint yourself. Put on your best garment and go down to the threshing floor. But do not make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. I want you to note, wash yourself anoint yourself, put on your best garment. Then Mark chapter 10, verse 46 to verse number 50. And it says, now they came to Jericho. And he went out of Jericho with his disciples and a great multitude, blind Bartimaeus, the son of Timaeus, sat by the road begging. And when he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to cry out and say, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. But many warned him to be quiet. Then he cried out all the more, son of David, have mercy on me. So Jesus stood still and commanded him to be called. Then they called the blind man saying to him, 
Be of good cheer, rise. He's calling you. And throwing aside his garment, he rose and came to Jesus. There is something that runs through all the stories we have read. Each one of them had a bad situation. Each one. Each one was called or invited by someone. And each one did something with their clothing when they were called. Joseph stepped out into a new career. Ruth stepped into a new relationship. And Bartimaeus stepped into a new way of life. Each one of them, when they were called, did something with their garment. Somebody say, I will change my garment tonight. So what does your garment represent? What you are wearing, what does it represent? First, it represents your covering, something that is covering you, something that keeps you from being exposed, from being naked, something that keeps you from hazards, something that gives you security. So when we say that you are, you are wearing clothing, it is giving you security, it is giving you safety, it is giving you protection. Now, in our part of the world, uh, maybe our garment, we don't see it as protecting us too much. But if you live in uh, the cold weathers of this world, by this time, if you go to Germany or go to the United States, the northern part of the United States, you better wear something very heavy because the weather is beginning to get cold. It's getting to winter. And if you don't wear the right clothing, you will be killed, literally killed by the weather. So what you are wearing there is a covering to protect you, to give you security, to give you comfort. That's the first thing about your garment. It gives you covering. Secondly, your clothing helps with your appearance how you portray yourself your clothing is an extension of who you are it reveals who you are it is one of the ways by which you are addressed and assessed by people the appearance of your clothing can bring shame to you or can bring glory to you if you are wearing torn clothing it brings shame. If you are wearing good clothing, not only do you turn yourself in the mirror many times before you leave the house, but everywhere you walk, you walk very slowly so that people will take time to recognize that you have arrived. Now, what is that doing? It is helping with your appearance. I look at some of your appearance today. It looks very, very powerful and very encouraging. Some of you, are, your appearance needs favor and grace from God uh, to, to help you along the journey. Somebody say, I'm changing what I'm wearing. Your clothing affects your appearance. And number three, your clothing affects or determines your status, your rank in life. It can show how high you are or how low you are. It can show your culture, your profession, or your position in life. Now, the way I dress, everywhere I go to, they will know I'm an African. Because this is the way I dress. Now, some of you people can't tell whether you are American or British because you are wearing nice suit with tie. So you are confusing everybody. So, but your clothing shows your culture. It shows sometimes your profession. If you go to a hospital and you see somebody with short white shirt and, uh, and a stethoscope around their neck, you will know that's the doctor. Sometimes they are lab technicians, but you know. So the clothing is showing his status in life. You see a nurse, you see that's the status. These days the lawyers have been ordered 
to wear wigs again. So all lawyers, you go to the court, you see somebody uh, who looks young but has a white wig on their head, that's a lawyer or a judge. Their clothing tells your status in life. Somebody said that you are addressed by the way you dress or your dress will show your address. If you go to a shop and you are shabbily dressed, whilst you are going around the shop, uh, a shop attendant will be following you. Not because they want to help you to buy, but because they are monitoring your movement. They look at your movement, the, the clothing you enter the shop, the manager will give them a sign. <laughs> so you'll be going around the shop and you see somebody is following you. You turn one aisle, they are following you. Everywhere you turn, they are following you because you look very suspicious. Why do you look suspicious? Because of the way you are dressed. But you can also dress in another way. And when you go to another place, doors open for you. Everybody wants to treat you well. You have to be sure that your dress is showing your right position in life. If you believe that God has blessed you, then you have to dress like somebody who is blessed. Amen? So your dress is for your covering. Your dress is for appearance. And your dress is for status. It shows your status in life. So, when I say change what you are wearing, these are the things I'm talking about. You have to change what you are covering yourself with or what has covered you. You have to change how you appear to the world and you have to change how you present yourself and your status in the world. Until you change these three things, the thing you have covered yourself in, how you advertise yourself, and the level you have attained in life, you will not get to the next level that God is calling you to. So now we'll come to the three people we talked about. Joseph, Ruth, and Bartimaeus. So let's look at Joseph a little closer. What garment was Joseph wearing? Joseph was wearing prison garments. He was in prison. And as a result, he was wearing prison garments. They were not garments he chose for himself. Because when you go to prison, you don't choose your garments. It is chosen for you. They were, not, they were garments he had to wear because of where life had brought him. Sometimes you don't decide to go somewhere, but life will take you somewhere. And when it takes you somewhere, it will give you a garment. And for Joseph, life had taken him to prison and it gave him a garment. It was a prison garment. That is what was covering him. That was his appearance. That was his status. But Joseph did not start his life with prison garments. If you know uh, Joseph, his life didn't start with prison garments. He started his life with another garment. It was called the coat of many colors. It was a garment of favor. It was a garment of acceptance. It was a garment that showed that there was hope for him. There was a vision for him. He believed that he was going to go to the stars. He believed he would be great in this life. That was how he started life. But sometimes you start with a garment of many colors and end up with prison garments. Not only did he have prison garments, but after his coat of many colors, he had a slave's garment because he was sold as a slave. And now he's wearing prison garments. Many garments removed from his first garment of many colors. I don't know where you are in life. Sometimes you look at your life and you see, look at where life has brought me. This is not what I was hoping to be. I had a dream. I had a vision. I had a hope. I wanted my life to be better. But now I am wearing prison garments. Prison garments represent crushed dreams. When your dreams have been crushed, when what you hope you will be you have not become. And you look at yourself and you say, when I was 16 years old, this is not where I thought I would be. When I was in school, this is not where I thought I would be. When I was in university, this is not where I, would, I thought I would be. I'm now in a place called prison. A prison is a place of limited movement. When you go to prison, you don't get up and say, well, I want to go and get fresh air. No, when you are in prison, your movement is limited. 
you are limited to a space. And even if you feel like moving, you'll be told how far you can go. There are people in this auditorium tonight who are wearing prison garments. Your dream is gone. You feel restricted. There are great things you want to do, but you can't move to do them. Because something is blocking your movement. The prison garment, sadly, also represents your companions. Because one thing about prison garment is everybody also is wearing the same garment in the prison with you. It is bad when you are in bad situation. But it is worse when you are in bad situation and everybody you know is in the same situation. When you are broke and everybody you know is broke, your broke is a bad broke. Because you are in prison. You look rev. Your best friend is also wearing the same garment like you. So you look at me and you say, I don't like my garment. You say, ah, how for do? This is what we have. You look at the next one and say, ah, we need to improve. They say, ah, no. All of us wear the same thing. We are all the same. And when you want to change, they are going to discourage you because everybody around you is wearing the same garment. That was Joseph's situation. He had moved from coat of many colors to prison garment. And he looks to the left, everybody's wearing prison garment. He looks to the right, everybody's wearing prison garment. His best friend is wearing prison garment. He complains and his best friend says, well, this is how life is. Have you ever gone to somebody to ask the person for money? And then the person tells you a more miserable story than the one you brought. It is called prison. He's your prison fellow, fellow prisoner. You are in prison with him. You say, ha, my marriage is bad though. You say, hey, yours is bad. Sit down, let me tell you about mine. And by the time he tells you about hers, you look at yourself and you say, well, maybe I'm not that bad. It's called prison. Prison is when you are in a problem and everybody you know is in the same problem. You are suffering and everybody is suffering. Nobody around you is inspiring you the life could be better. That is where Joseph was. For 17 years, he has been in this situation. 17 years in prison. In, in Egypt, he went as a servant. Now he's a prisoner. I'm sure there were times that Joseph will remember. I used to have a coat of many colors. I didn't used to have prison garments. Look at what life has brought me. Look at life, where life has brought me. One day in prison, Joseph is, gets up because he's, he's been made prefect of the prison. But he's still prisoner. But he has a little title in prison, prefect. He gets up and he sees two other prisoners. One of them is the baker of Pharaoh. The other one is the butler of Pharaoh. And they all look very depressed. So he asked them, what's happening? They said, we had a bad dream. We had a bad dream. He says, okay, okay. Before I came to prison, I had a gift. And I came to prison still. I have that gift, although nobody uses it, but I still have it. I can interpret dreams. I used to dream. I used to have great dreams. And I can interpret your dream. So tell me your dream. The baker said, I had a dream. And in my dream, I was holding bread and some birds came and uh, took the bread from me. And Joseph said, hmm, that's quite an interesting dream, but it's, it's not a good dream. You are in prison, but you are moving from bad to worse. Three days from now, you'll be killed. I'm sure the man is wondering, should I have told you the dream at all? What kind of dream interpreter is this? The other guy says, well, I had a dream. And he tells Joseph the dream. I was holding wine before Pharaoh. My, and I re, I, in my dream, I had been returned to my position. Joseph said, that's a good dream. You are going to be returned to your position in three days. Three days, it happened. The baker is executed. The butler is promoted. Joseph tells the butler, hey, 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 remember, we used to wear the same garment. 
And when you go, tell Pharaoh, I've been falsely accused. And let him do something about my case. The man forgot about him for two years. Then Pharaoh had a dream, which he couldn't interpret. And the, and the, and the butler, for the first time, remembers. And he says, well, when I was in prison, there was this guy, a Hebrew boy called Joseph, and he could interpret dreams. I think if everybody has failed, Pharaoh, go and fetch this guy in prison. So Joseph is in prison wearing his prison garment, and he has, he has a call. They say, Pharaoh is looking for you. I don't know about you, but if you were Joseph and you were in prison, and you hear Pharaoh is looking for you, it may not be exciting because by his own experience, there's a 50-50 chance. You can either be killed or you may be promoted. So Pharaoh is looking for you doesn't mean you'll be promoted. It may mean you're going to be executed. Now he has to choose the one he will believe is going to happen to him. So he hears Pharaoh is looking for you and Joseph says, I have moved with many garments. I used to wear the garment of many colors. I used to wear a servant's garment. I am now wearing prison garments, but I believe my level is about to change. And if my level is about to change, I'm not going to stand before Pharaoh looking like a prisoner. So the Bible says he shaved himself. He removed the mark of a prisoner from him. And the Bible says he changed his garment. He changed his garment. I wonder where did he get that garment from? I believe he came with it outside into prison. He held that garment on him. I believe in all likelihood it was his first garment. Or probably another garment that he had along the way. But it was not prison garment. He came out from freedom into prison with this garment. And when he came, he hid it in prison. With the hope that one day God will call me. And when God calls me, I'm not going to answer as a prisoner. So he changes his garment. And he wears a new garment. Not as a prisoner. But as a free man and he goes to stand before Pharaoh and when Pharaoh sees him he doesn't see a prisoner he sees a man of confidence a man who believes his destiny has changed and not only did he change his own garment because of the way he presented himself Pharaoh also changed his garment and gave him the greatest garment of all. It was not the favor garment. It was not a servant's garment. Not the prison garment. Not a free man's garment. But it was a garment of a king. Of a ruler. Of a master. Of Egypt. Why did Joseph change his garment? Because when God calls you to another level. You cannot present yourself from the previous level. If God says, if you are going to interview for managing director, you don't dress like a messenger. If you are going out and you want to be married, you don't dress like somebody who doesn't need a husband. Excuse me to say, like a prostitute. Because if you believe God is calling you higher, then the way you appear, the way you cover yourself, the way you present yourself must be equal to the calling that you have received. Joseph determined, I've been in prison, I've been called out of prison, I am not going to show myself as a prison. Tell somebody next to you, change what you are wearing. When God calls you to a higher level, don't talk low. When God raises you to a higher level, don't, don't pity yourself. Look at me, as for me, nothing happens to me, life is hard, life is hard. When God calls you blessed, you don't say life is hard. When God calls you blessed, you have to change your garment and present yourself as a blessed person. As a blessed person. You have to. You have to. Joseph changed his garment. He changed his garment. Ruth 
also changed her garment. What was the garment with, uh, Ruth was wearing? Ruth was wearing a widow's garment. Ruth's story is a very sad one. She's living in a country called Moab. One day, a group comes to their hometown. They are from Bethlehem of Judea. The woman is called Naomi and is married. And, the man, and they have two boys, two sons. For some reason, one of the boys falls in love with Ruth. And who doesn't like a foreigner? You know, it's like an American comes to Ghana, all the girls who want to marry the American. So who doesn't like a foreigner? So they, he marries into this family. And another girl also marries the other boy. So now Ruth is married into the family. The other girl who married the family is called Opa. And then there is Naomi with a husband. One day, Naomi, Ruth's mother-in-law, screams, what is happening? My husband is dead. Ruth's father-in-law dies. Disaster has hit the family. As if that was not enough. The other boy dies. Two deaths of two men in one family. And then, it hits Ruth's husband. In a short time, father and two sons dead, leaving the women. If you were living in those days in Israel, that was not good. Because we didn't have women's, lib women's liberation at that time. If you were a woman and you didn't have a husband, your life was not very encouraging. So here is Ruth. She thought life was going to be great. She's fallen in love. She thought she had entered a family where she would be blessed. The family is in disaster. Her life is in disaster. Everybody around her is in disaster. So as happens, her mother-in-law changed her garment. Naomi changed and she started wearing widow's garment. Ruth also wore widow's garment. To advertise to everybody, everywhere you go, that's a widow. The other girl, Opa, also wore widow's garment. One day, Naomi says, I'm going back to my country. Life has not been good to me. I'm going back to Ghana. And so, she sets out. And the two daughters-in-law who have lost their husbands say they will follow her. She says, listen, don't follow me. There's no hope for you. Where I'm going, there's no hope. My life is bitter. I'm very angry. Life is not good for me. If you follow me, your life will be miserable. And the other girl wisely said, yeah, I think that's good advice. So, Ma, thank you for giving me a dead husband. Go back to your country whatever you brought from your country to my country, go with it. I will stay here. Ruth somehow said, I will go with you. And she utters some very profound words of loyalty. Wherever you go, you, I will go. And where you die, I will die. Now, many times we say that as a mark of loyalty. And, and, and it's good. It's good. In fact, in our, our wedding vows in, in our church, we say, I'll go where you go, uh, mimicking uh, uh, Ruth. But Ruth was not speaking in faith. Her last statement is, where you die, I will die. In other words, I know where you are going. Life will not be good to you. I know you are going to die in your country, and I'm going quietly with you, so we'll die together. She didn't expect any change in life. She knew that where they were, death has visited them. It has visited the men. It's going to start with the women. It will start with Naomi. And when it hits Naomi, I'm ready. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to die. So when Ruth starts moving, she didn't expect her life would change. 
So she's wearing her widow's garment. Death. Isolation. Suspicion. Because if the people of Bethlehem in the days of Ruth were like Ghanaians, and I think they were like Ghanaians. If you were a woman like Naomi or Ruth and you enter town, everybody will give you space. If you are Ghanaian, they will say, these are the witches. They've chewed their husbands and now they have come back here and woe on you if you go and marry in this family they will chew you up they will say do you know they chew up the first one and then they chew the second one and they chew the third one and do you know they are here do you know where they live can you imagine if your son is going to marry one of them the kind of family delegations who will come and, and make sure you never marry into that family because it's a bad luck family. So this is Ruth. The only way to have a living is to look like a widow so people will pity her. Her whole life is dependent on people pitying her. So anytime she sees people, she has to pretend for them to pity her. It's like the, 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 the beggars around town they have nice stories and songs they sing so they knock on your car door go, 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 go. and sing a nice pitiful song and when you don't respond they go to the next person because that's the only way they can survive they can't tell you sir i need 20 cities Beggar can't ask you to say, I need 20 cities. He will beg and beg and beg and beg and beg and beg. If you don't mind him, he'll go to the next person and beg and beg and beg and beg and beg and beg. That was Ruth's story. One day she goes to a farm. According to the law that God gave to Israel, he God told the Jews when they made a farm and they harvested the farm, they should leave when they are harvesting, they should have leftovers so that people who don't have like Ruth can come and collect the pieces so Ruth goes from farm to farm to do that one day she goes to a farm and she starts collecting the leftovers she's out there in the field and as she's collecting wearing her widow's garment black dark the boss of the farm the most eligible bachelor in Bethlehem he is rich he is handsome and all the girls like him he comes to the farm and he sees that girl wearing black he says who is that lady collecting leftover on our farm they say well is that bad luck girl who came with a bad luck mother-in-law and uh, we, we, we didn't even want her to come to the farm today because she's bringing bad luck here. We don't know who will die after she leaves this farm because everywhere they go, people die. The man, Boaz, says to the servants, hmm, make sure today, don't just leave small leftovers. Just leave bundles, bundles for her so she can collect. So Ruth is going around and she's picking bundles and bundles. I'm sure she's saying, well, today is a good day. You know, favor, favor, favor. And it's favor. She heaps up the bundles and she goes home. She has no clue what is about to change in her life. That she's about to step into a new relationship. And her mother-in-law says, how come you came too early? And how come you have so many bundles? He said, well, I went to a farm. He says, who is the owner of the farm? He said, well, there's a guy called Boaz. He says, Boaz? Yeah. So, okay. Mother-in-law goes to make all her research as mother-in-law how, know how to do. do. That's all the research. Comes back and said, you know the trick? This Boaz, the reason why he left you bundles is because he likes you. 
Because only mothers-in-law can interpret some language. It is coded signal. It's like when, when a young man goes to visit another lady with, with uh, buns bread. And, and goes and says, oh, I was just passing here and uh, I saw some buns bread and I said, I, maybe you like buns bread. I, maybe you don't even like, but I said, maybe you like buns bread and you brought buns bread. Now the girl may take it like, ah, oh, what is bread? But if there is a mother-in-law mature woman, you say, this is not ordinary bread, oh. This one is carrying a message. The man is sending you a signal. He is conveying a message to you. He is telling you, my eyes are on you. So that is what Naomi says to Ruth. He says, the reason why Boaz left you all of that is because he's giving you a message. They are not just dropping wheat there by, by chance. This is a communication. This is high level communication. And so he tells her, the man loves you. I'm sure Ruth is saying, me? Yeah, you. But the men around me die, but the man loves you. But my garment is that of a widow, but the man loves you. Your destiny is about to change. And when God calls you to a higher level, your garment must change. So he says to Ruth, wash yourself. Wash yourself of every image of widow. Cleanse yourself ritually from the stigma of your past and put on new clothes, bright clothes. The question is, where were the clothes? She had them. Why wasn't she wearing them? Because she was a widow. And those clothes were the clothes she used to wear when she was a nice girl. She was a beautiful girl. Now her condition has changed and she's wearing widow's clothes. But she goes back. She rolls back the time. She says, I'm still a nice girl from Bethlehem. Moab didn't treat me well, but my time has come again. And Bethlehem is calling me again. So she baths. She changes her clothes, she perfumes herself, and she goes to meet Boaz, and the rest, as they say, is history. They married, they gave birth to Jesse, Jesse gave birth to, Jesus, uh, to, to David, and from that came the line of Jesus Christ, from a widow who changed her garment. What had happened? Like Joseph, a call came to him in prison. Like in Ruth, a call comes to her as a widow. And she decides, if God is calling me to a higher level, I cannot present myself in the same old way. I have to talk different. I have to think different. I have to dress different. I have to show myself different. The problem with most of you is God changes your destiny, but you present yourself in the same old way. God turns the situation around, but you talk in the same old way because your garment never changes. Some have the garment of poverty, they wear it all the time. Garment of fear, they wear it all the time. Garment of disappointment, they wear it all the time. Even when God is opening a door, they say, well, as for me, I don't trust anybody because people have disappointed me. That was your old garment. It's time to change your garment. Tell somebody next to you, change what you are wearing. The last one, Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was wearing beggar garments. Because in, in the days of Jesus, the beggars had to identify themselves. That's like doctors identify themselves, beggars identify themselves with their garment. He wears his beggar, beggar garments, goes to sit on the road between Jerusalem and Jericho, 
and beg. And he's been doing it for so long in his life. As a matter of fact, he's been doing it so long that people call him by his condition, blind Bartimaeus, a beggar. And as he sits on the Jericho Road, which is one of the busiest routes in Jerusalem, he hears conversation back and forth. He's blind, but he can hear. And he hears, there's a man called Jesus. He's from Nazareth, a prophet, a teacher, a rabbi from Nazareth called Jesus. And he's doing miracles, and he's doing signs, and he's doing this. And, and I'm sure people sometimes come and congregate around where he is, and they tell about stories of Jesus and so on and so forth, and stories of Jesus. And he's wondering, who is this Jesus? How does he look like? Can he turn my situation around? And he's wondering, one day he's sitting with his beggar garment. He's covered himself as a beggar. He has told himself, I'm a beggar. Years ago, somebody told me, you know, pastor, some of us, God called us to be beggars for other people to take care of us. If you think like that, you have a beggar garment. That's how you cover yourself. That's how you appear. That's the status. But Timius is sitting there and he hears a commotion. Noise is coming from the Jerusalem side. Noise is coming. And as the noise is coming, he's getting close and people are talking, hey, where, where, where? there are all kinds of noise and all kinds of noise. And he calls one of them and says, hey, what's happening? Who, what, what's happening here? What's happening on the road? They say, well, Jesus of Nazareth, Yeshua is coming. He's coming from where? Well, he's coming this way. He's blind. So he starts shouting, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus, son of David, have mercy. But everybody too is shouting. So his shouting doesn't make a difference. Jesus, son of David, everybody is shouting. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Jesus. He's also shouting Jesus, Jesus. And then he sees gradually Jesus is passing him by. Jesus is passing him by. And then he says, hey, 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 hey. This is not the time to keep quiet. So he raises his voice. Jesus! Son of David! And people say, hey, 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 shh, 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 shh. He's healing better people, not your kind. He's healing better people. And the Bible says when they told him to keep quiet, he shouted the more. He's screaming because he realizes Jesus is moving away from him. He can hear the sound is diminishing. And he shouts, Jesus, the son of David, have mercy on me. And somewhere along the line, Jesus stops. And he says, who is that calling my name? They say, well, he's a Jericho beggar. You know, our own personal beggar here. So he says, go and bring him. Now, what Jesus would do, nobody knows. Like Joseph, Pharaoh says, go and bring Joseph. Whether he'll be killed or he'll live, he didn't know, but he changed his garment. Like Ruth, he didn't know what will happen when she goes out that night, but she changed her garment. So, Bartimaeus, they come and tap him and say, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay. Keep quiet. The man has heard you. Keep quiet, he's calling you. And the moment he hears he's calling you, he takes his beggar garment and he throws it away. <laughs> but Timius is saying, I don't know what will happen to me today, but from tonight or this afternoon, I will never be a beggar again. My life will change, my encounter will change, my story will change. So he took his beggar garment and threw it away and he goes to meet Jesus and Jesus heals him and that was the end 
of begging for Bartimaeus. Joseph had a call, he changed his garment. Ruth had a call, she changed her garment. Bartimaeus had a call, he changed his garment. What does it tell us? Anytime God is calling you, you must change something about you. You must change something about you. You must change your garment. It doesn't necessarily mean go and dress differently, although sometimes it helps to do that. But it means change what is covering you. Change the thing that you have covered yourself with. Oh, I am, I am down, I am poor, I am weak, I am sick, I am a widow, I, I can't make it, I, I, you know, rich people are talking, and, and as for us, we are poor. I remember when I was going to secondary school from one, the advice my mother gave me. He says, when you go to school, remember we are poor. That's her, <laughs> her good advice. My mother was a very good woman, very spiritual Christian, filled with the spirit, very prayerful, but she didn't hear the kinds of messages I'm preaching today. So she says, be very careful. Don't go and try it and do by heart in school. Remember the family you are coming from. We are poor. So when you go and people are going on strike, don't go because we are poor. So I was covering myself in poverty. I had decided I'm poor. So I remember when I was in Form 1, the whole school went on strike. And I was a Form 1 boy. Form 1! But I had advice. We are poor. When they go on strike, don't go. So I was in Form 1. The school went on strike because they said they didn't like the food that was being uh, cooked. Because, you know, those days schools were better. And for a season, we were eating fried cassava and sardines and pepper. And then uh, that was for lunch. And evening, we eat only chicken, 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 chicken. And people say chicken, 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 chicken is boring. So they were going on strike. And in the morning, we take cocoa. And uh, cocoa and bread with sugar, no milk, but cocoa. Cocoa is cocoa, believe you me, cocoa is cocoa. With sugar and bread and granite paste in the bread and butter. And they were going on strike. But my mother had told me, right from when I left home, we are poor. So we went to the dining hall, everybody said they wouldn't eat. It was breakfast. The cocoa was there. Everybody had left their bread. I was sitting at the table, from one board, there were seniors all over around me I took my plate and I finished it and I look around and I, people have left their plate so I pulled the next one and I marked it I'm telling you the honest truth I was on the second one I finished it then I pulled the third one and a senior came to hold the back of my of my shirt and said what are you doing we are on strike I didn't tell him, but I'll say in my head, my mother said, we are poor. <laughs> you see, you remember, you are poor. When you go and they are going on strike, don't go. Eat the food. Because there will be no provision for you. I'm not giving you provision. Eat from the dining hall. I said, sir, I came with strict instructions. Strict instructions. Don't miss dining hall. Eat. Some of you have Gary Sokins. You have... Uh, Tinapa, you have uh, uh, corned beef. I have nothing. This is my life. I am poor. Now, there are people who have clothed themselves with poverty. Maybe when you were growing up, your father told you, we are poor. Your mother told you, we are poor. I will never forget a story a church member told me. Very interesting story. He said when he was growing up, for some reason, 
He had an uncle who used to tell him that louvers, louvers were expensive. And he says he, he had it so much. You know, you know hey, louvers are very expensive. Louvers are those days, you know, we used to use wooden, wooden louvers. Those of you who are a bit older. And the glass louvers with the glass uh, frame is very expensive. So he grew up believing that louvers are very expensive. He didn't ask the price, but he was told his louvers is expensive. You don't just go and buy louvers, so you don't buy louvers. So he said he rented a house. And the house didn't have louvers. It, it, it was window, open window, and there were no louvers. But he was doing business. He was making some little money, selling things here and there. And he was making money. But he was told louvers were expensive. So he never fixed the louvers. So he had rubber coverings on the, on the louvers. He says, when it rains, the rain will come in and beat him and his wife and children in the house. He was endangering his wife, endangering his children because louvers are expensive. So he said one day it had rained like that and the water had come into his house, his sitting room. And a friend came to the house. He said, ah, why is there water here? He says, where well, the rain, the rain brought the water. He said, ah, put some louvers there. He said, no, louvers are expensive. Louvers are very expensive. And the guy said, what do you mean louvers are expensive? Your business, you are doing well. He even had a car. He had managed to buy a car, but he can't buy louvers. Believe you me, words are very powerful. Words are dangerous. And he said, his friend said to him, what do you mean Louvers I spent? So the friend went to bring a carpenter. The carpenter came, took measurements. And then went to calculate and gave him the bill. And this is what he told me. He said he saw the bill and started crying. He said, I've been a fool all my life. I've put myself in danger. I've inconvenienced my wife, my children, simply because somebody drummed it in my head when I was young. Louvers are expensive. He was living in a family house and they used to fight about louvers. And that's where he got the idea. He didn't check the price, but he was wearing the garment of poverty. You can be rich and wear the garment of poverty. The problem of people is what they are wearing. What they keep advertising to the world. What they keep telling the world about themselves. What they keep showing to the world. But when God calls you, if you want change, the first thing you do, you take off your garment. You change your garment. Your garment must not represent your past. It must not represent where you are now. It must represent where you are going. I remember years ago, you know, in Ghana, everybody, no, not everybody, some of us, our parents never had cars. So I didn't grow up in a house with car. So we grew up with Trotro. And Trotro in the 60s and 70s was a different ball game from now. These days it's improved. Your Trotro, some of you even have uh, fun in your Trotro. Those days Trotro was two ways. There was the bone shaker, the, what they call mummy truck. And then there was the other one, the Bedford one, where you sit facing each other. And that is the one that when you sit in and, and you think you are comfortable and the driver wants you to really add more passengers, he does a sharp break and everybody moves to one side, then he add, they add two more passengers. So that's what I, I was used to, Trotro. 
I took trotro for a long time. You know, and, and when you use the mummy truck, those days the wooden, the, the wooden bedford truck, you, you, you master it. I mean, you know how to chase, chase the trotro and jump and hold on and stylishly put your other foot in and sit down. All in one swift movement. Very acrobatic. I, mean. I had mastered all of that because that's how you survive. But you know, at one point, something said to me, I said, I deserve better. I deserve better. So I made a vow to myself. I said, from today, I'm changing. I didn't understand change your government, but I said, from today, I will never take trotro again in my life. I never take trotro. Did I have money? No. Had my salary increased? No. But I said, I will never take trotro again. And if I don't have money for taxi, I will walk. And I did a lot of walking. <laughs> I did because many times I didn't have money. I would rather walk. I walked, which was, I didn't know it was good exercise then, but it was good exercise. Walk, I walk everywhere. I walk, I walk everywhere, everywhere. I mastered walking. But if I have money, I take a taxi. If I don't have money, I walk. But Trotro, I say, you, I will never take you. Because I'm going to a higher level. So I started taking taxi. Then I took taxi for a while. And the taxi, three passengers at the back. Sometimes the people are just, you know, touching you in a way and you didn't like. So I did taxi, 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 taxi. Sometimes they put two passengers in front and, and four at the back instead of three. So, one day I said to myself, I'll never take taxi again. So I've moved from level one to level two. I said level two, I don't even like level two. I won't take taxi, taxi with other passengers again. From now on, I will take dropping. And if I don't have money, I will walk. So I walked a lot, but when I have money, I take dropping. I said, Trotro, I'm out with you. Taxi with other passengers. Those of you who like passengers, God bless you. Me, I like to be by myself. If I'm walking, I know I'm walking. But I'm sitting in car, I don't want people to disturb me. So I took dropping for a while, walk, drop, walk, drop a bit. At a point, I just said, you know, I don't think I want to take dropping again. So I'm going to get my own car. And if I don't get my own car, I will walk. Now, I didn't know where the car would come from. I didn't have money. Just that week, somebody spoke to me and said, I have a car in my garage. I haven't used it for a very long time. It's a very old, rickety car, but maybe you can do something with it. You know, when you have nothing, everything is okay. So, I was introduced to this car. It was a very small car. It looked very ugly, but it was nice to me. So I brought the car out. It had too many problems, had a little money, fixed what I could fix. No, those days in Ghana, even if you had only one light, it's okay. You know, because everybody's lights were not working. So if your lights are not, if your brake is not working, it's okay. There was nothing like roadworthy because everybody was not worthy. So I said, well, <laughs> I have this car. So I put the car together and started moving it, driving it. I remember the first time I learned to drive and drove that car. I felt so proud. I said, wow, I have moved from Trotro to taxi with passengers, to dropping, to now myself, I'm driving my own car. Now that car, I later painted it red. Danger. And I've said many times that that car was a demon-possessed car. It was fully demon-possessed. The devil had possessed the car. You know how I know it was demon possessed? Because when it was moving to go like this, go, 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 go. I say, yeah, the spirit has come upon the car. It's a demon possessed car. This guy's, the devil has possessed this car. 
but it is my car. And if your car is demon possessed, you will still drive it. It gave me a lot of trouble. The, the, the water heater, the radiator used to heat and the water would be boiling. Pop, 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 pop. So I kept ice blocks in the car. <laughs> so anytime the water starts heating, I put ice blocks in. Then it will go a little bit. It left me in many places, disgraced me. I remember when I was going to marry my wife, I drove it to her house. I had a car. Demon possessed, but I had a car. I didn't take trot trot to her house. I took my car. Demon possessed car. And I will never forget when we were, I was leaving her house and the car said, I won't leave. The car said, I won't, I won't go. So her brothers had to come and push. <laughs> And afterwards, they laughed at her. Look at the man you have brought. He's pushing his car out of the house. <laughs> but it was my car. It was my car. What am I saying? There will be many times when God is calling you to a higher level. You can't stay with your old garment in that place. You have to determine. He's calling me. I'm throwing away my beggar garment. I may not be healed. I may not have solution, but I am determined I will not be a beggar again. I don't know where my life will end, but I am determined. When Joseph was called by Pharaoh, he said, I may die. I may be executed, but I'm determined I will not dress like a prisoner again. He changed his garment. When Ruth was called, she didn't know what the message was, but she determined I am not going to present myself as a widow again. She changed her garment. Tonight, somebody must change his garment. I said, somebody must change his garment. Somebody must change what he is wearing. God is calling you to a higher level. God is calling you to abundance. God is calling you to favor. God is calling you to increase. You can't stay there and say, I will wait and see. You don't wait and see. You change your garment and meet God. And when you meet him, he will address you properly. I don't know where you are in life. But for some of you, just like the steps I used to take, you may have to take some step. For somebody, you may just have to say, I will not live with my mother again. I'm going to live with my own house. For somebody, you may say, I will build my house. For somebody, it will be to say, this year, I will marry. I don't know what garment you need to change, but tonight, you are going to change your garment. Maybe you have managed a small business, but you are about to manage an international conglomerate and you have to change your garment. You have to change the location of your business. You have to change your address. Where your address is, only poor people will come and look for you. Put yourself in a place where people who qualify for your kind of business can come and look for you. I don't know where you are, but somebody say, I'm changing my garment. I want you to determine the one thing that you are changing tonight. One decision you are making to say from tonight, I am changing this garment. I am moving from this level. From tonight, I will never stay here again. I vow to God that I will not stay here again. Just one thing, not 10 things, just one thing. And lift up your hands to God. And begin to cry on the Lord. And like Bartimaeus cried, you're going to say, Lord, from tonight, I am breaking out of this situation. Lord, from tonight, I'm shaking this condition out of my life. Lord, from tonight, I'm changing this garment. Just call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. Call upon the Lord. Cry to the Lord. You are not going to complain again. You are not going to always complain about how life 
has mistreated you. You are changing your garment. You are changing your confession. You are changing your story. You are changing your song. Oh, talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord, talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Somebody's life is about to change. Somebody's destiny is turning. Somebody's destiny is turning. Somebody's destiny is turning. Somebody's destiny is turning. I refuse to be little. I refuse to be small. I refuse to be despised. I refuse to live at the bottom. I will not live at the bottom again. I'm changing my garment. Every garment of restriction, we break free from it. Every garment of self-pity, we break free from it. Every garment of begging, we break free from it. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, I come against every spirit of broken dreams. Broken dreams, disappointed dreams, broken stories, and future that is not what you envisage. In the name of Jesus, I declare to you what you saw in your youth, what you saw 20 years ago, what you saw 30 years ago, what you believe God has called you to be. I command your dream to manifest. I command your dream to manifest. I command your vision to manifest. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, your dream will manifest. Your vision will manifest. Your dream will manifest. Your vision will manifest. Begin to pray to God and, Lord, and say, Lord, let my dream manifest. Let my vision manifest. Let my purpose manifest. Let my assignment manifest. Let my calling manifest. You called me, Lord. You spoke to me, Lord. You revealed it to me, Lord. Let it manifest, Lord. Let it manifest, Lord. Let my dream manifest. 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 In the name of Jesus. I believe for some of you, the next step you take from here, you're going to meet a king. Yes. You're going to meet a king. Yes. You're going to meet a kingmaker. Yes. A kingmaker. Yes. You're going to meet somebody who will turn your life around. Yes. A new pharaoh is coming your way. Yes. Somebody is coming to you. Yes. A new call is coming to you. So I want you to lift up your hand and say, Lord, connect me to destiny. Connect me to destiny, Lord. Connect me to destiny, Lord. Connect me to destiny, Lord. Connect me, connect me to a man of destiny, to a woman of destiny. Somebody who is destiny for my next level. Connect me to the person. Talk to the Lord. Talk to the Lord. Destiny connection. Yes. Destiny connection. Last prayer we're going to pray. There are people here. It seems as if every time you want to rise, there are people telling you, shut up. There's somebody putting you down, somebody stopping you. You are like bloody Batimias. You cry and they shut up. You cry, they say, shut up. But tonight, you will not shut up. Yes. Nobody will stop you again. Yes. Nobody will push you back again. Yes. Nobody will keep you away from your destiny yes. again. Tonight, you are going to say, Lord, I rise from this place 
and nobody will put me down again and nobody will shut me up again and nothing will stop me again and nothing will push me back again from today i'm moving to my destiny i will not be stopped i will not be stopped i will not be resisted in the name of jesus begin to pray begin to pray begin to pray begin to pray pray with understanding pray with a spirit pray with intensity i will not be denied I will not be shut up. I will not be denied. I will not be shut up. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I will not be denied. I will not be shut up. Those who have pushed me back in the past, I push beyond them. 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 I will rise up. I will rise up. I will cry out. My voice will be heard. 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 My business will be known. My business will be known. I will be recognized. I will be celebrated. I will be acknowledged. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Tonight I came here with a very simple message from God to you. God is calling you. He's calling you to a higher level. He's calling you to destiny. And don't go back and be the same. Change that garment. Change that confession. Change the way you present yourself. Because there is a divine visitation upon your life. God bless you in Jesus' name.